Uh, I really want to uh, give some thanks to the people who worked really hard to organize the conference. Uh, Carl was the head of that effort, so thank you very much to Carl. And uh, he also got some, some very uh, helpful assistance from Michael Ann Bradley, Bryant Smith, Nathan Hadfield in the back, and Linda Nauman, who was helping us with the, the uh, refreshments in the back and setting up the table. So thank you to all of them. Uh, second, we, we have a, a tradition uh, to present some gifts to our keynote speakers. Uh, those gifts have not arrived yet, so we'll have to, uh, we'll have to provide those to you after the fact. Um, but uh, we're going to be presenting Rosalind with a copy of Eric's book. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, Eric will be receiving uh, Wrestling the Angel, uh, Terrell Gibbons' book. So. <laughs> um, and finally, we'd like to invite Eric and Rosalind to come join me up here for a few minutes. I think we have probably about between 15 and 20 minutes. Oh, yes, thank you. To have our screen and more people to work. So in a society that you said that we'll be happy to my event, but whatever, is making with someone else, how would that work in a society in terms of politics, diplomacy, international affairs? How would that work? I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, look, it obviously works to some extent, for instance, in, for instance, the polyamorous communities on the West Coast or the few that are on the East Coast. Go to Eugene, Oregon. Ask them. They're into that stuff. Um, well, I mean, I mean, they are. Uh, and so somehow I don't, I don't think that those future... One of the things about transhumanism is transcending humanity, and I know that I have a lot of human failures. Uh, I, I can be aggressive in inappropriate ways. I can be sexual in inappropriate ways. I can be, uh, have all sorts of emotions that come from a background that I would hope that transhuman Eric's would transcend. And so I would hope that transhuman politics in future universes would be a superior form of politics, something more virtuous. Uh, I, I enjoyed the thing on Zion that one would think that somehow, uh, you know, I would posit a transfinite series of Zions, but those will not have the same kind of politics we have here. And hopefully they would be better politics. I'll just say one thing, then I'm going to give it to you because this is your department. So, I I don't um, I don't have to subscribe to the mythos of a war in heaven, um, but I certainly like, for instance, John Hick, who says, look, uh, he describes a plurality of heavens, a series of heavens, and, and so forth. And much of uh, my original ideas are based on based on John Hick. Um, conflict doesn't necessarily have to be war. I like chess. Uh, nobody dies, uh, the pieces come back. And uh, so Hicks says, for instance, well, in, in the future worlds, there will be struggle. But the struggle that we have here is defective in many ways. 
or incomplete in many ways. When I fight my opponent, even if I honor him or her or whatever, they, they die and they're killed. That's not, I don't see that that's required in a superior world, right? And so what, if there are wars in future heaven, they're going to be a lot, maybe it'll be like Valhalla, right? We'll all go out and fight and it'll be great. We'll have a great time slaughtering each other and our bodies will rise at the end of the day and we'll go and get drunk and do it again tomorrow, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, yeah, why not? <clears throat> but maybe you got, you, you asked for all three. Asked for... Uh, so you, you ask what conditions uh, would give rise to a war in the presence of a supremely loving being. Um, and I think there's, there's really only one condition that's necessary, and that is conflicting desires. Um, love by its nature um, is something that uh, grants freedom. Um, love cannot be coerced, and it is not coercive. Um, and as a consequence, um, if, there is, if there is a sufficient degree of freedom to have a conflicting desire, I think there, that's a sufficient condition to allow for a war. Um, now, uh, obviously, the love can be very persuasive, but I don't think it guarantees the avoidance of war, and I, I don't know that there is a way to guarantee that um, that isn't simply the elimination of uh, the desire that conflicts with yours. Oh, sorry, you were about to answer something. I was just going to see if we can get the two of you to sort of address each other's ideas in some way. I would love to hear that, please. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about it? <laughs> Are you gonna, are but, but please feel free to answer the question. Answer on the war. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I'm hesitating because, um, I, I, I don't really know. I mean, I have, I haven't given a lot of thought. I would, I would say, I think, um, the conditions that could give rise to another war in heaven are the same conditions, presumably, that structure a material cosmos as we know it. That is, that that matter has two aspects, right? One is, is resistance and one is availability. And, and resistance is, is the difference in the particularity. The, avail, av, the availability is the, um, the, the willingness to enter into forms of relation. And even, of course, in a war, you have, you've got both, right? You have the conflict, but you also have the alliances and the cooperation on opposing sides. So I, I don't think that um, any, any other new condition needs to arise. I think the conditions are already, are already present and, and always will be. Can we, should we address each other's thing then? Because I want to say that, uh, so you're Rosalind. Yes. Rosalind. And I'm terrible with names. Who was the, we, what, you with the camera. What's your name? Blair. Blair. I, I, was, I was struck not, not being a Mormon and, and following, I do follow some of the things that go on in, in all sorts of religious groups uh, in the United States today. And I've just been struck by the emergence of uh, female voices in Mormonism. And the, I don't know if it's appropriate or not to say Mormon feminism. I'm not being involved in it. Well, I don't, I don't want to you know, speak for others. I mean, but if there is, then fine. I've, I've been following that, and I, I say that I know there are vast religious changes, especially in younger generations. And certainly, as a non-Mormon, from what I've seen here, uh, looks like Mormonism has a fascinating, uh, fascinating future. That would be my take on, you know, a lot of the things that I've heard here. Um, no, no, I think we should call on another. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
two fundamental principles to being a design community. So why do we have segregation in that? And in the towards me? Yeah. <laughs> so um, can you expand on that? What do you mean by, by segregation? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't want to defend that, that particular proposition. Um, I, I, I am not certain that that is indeed how it will be. I don't know that that's necessarily an inevitable reading of our understanding of you know, the, the degrees of glory. I think there's a much more developmental um, and universal reading that's possible of, uh, you know, of, of eternal progression, not eternal stasis and eternal sorting into, into the division. So I think that there is um, a much more developmental and dynamic um, if we believe in um, in ma a material um, universe that cannot escape from time, right? Then then we really can't conceive of um, you know sort of eternal sorting into the laundry baskets and, and sitting there for all of eternity. That's not how I think we need to or even can read it. Um, so I think you are free to um, I think you're you're free to think of it in a different way. All right, so we'll have we'll have uh, just what five more, three more minutes. <laughs> All right, um, I just wanted I just wanted to reinforce a little bit with a with a fun anecdote. Um, when, when I uh, attended uh, BYU, I took uh, some religion classes from Joseph Fielding McConkey, the son of Bruce R. McConkey. And he loved to tell the story about how he and his father always disagreed about whether these. Uh, these various groupings in heaven were uh, physical separation or whether they were more like a state of being. His father had thought they were physical separation and he thought they were a state of being and he says, and now that he's dead, he knows that I'm right. <laughs> James. Yeah, I'm. I'm not going to engage with your interpretation of the effects of the proclamation. I, I think we, you know, I, I we've seen those those we've seen those conversations happen. So, um, I think I think we want to hold on to the proclamation, though. Um, a, we're going to. <laughs> it's it's not going to go away. So it's here. I think we want to, though. I think um, it's 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 really. Can you imagine anything in the Hebrew Bible conceptualizing men and women as equal partners? Right. There's nothing like it in canonized scripture. This is the closest that we have to having a canonized basis for gender equality. Now, maybe we would want it to be different. We would want you know we would want to change it, but it's there, um, and it's there to be used. 
in the way that every religious community has um, used its sacred texts, right? Has um, reread, reinterpreted, redeemed, and saved um, relevant bits of its sacred texts and applied them moving forward. I think that's exactly um, what we are called to do with the proclamation, um, as we are with with all of the texts that um, that you know canonization and the proclamation is not canonized. Um, perhaps that may happen someday. Um, that that the relationship that canonization structures between the believer and the text. So I. I um, the problem of authority in Mormonism won't go away, and I don't have a solution to it. Um, so I, I can't tell you what to do about church leaders who keep on saying things you don't like to hear, you know. But all I can say is that we have it. I think we should read it and use it, um, and that's what I'm trying to do. So. I'll say, can I say one thing as a non-Mormon? Um, the problem of authority might go away much faster than you think. There's nothing been in religion that's been fixed or eternal on this earth. And one of the things that if you study the history of religions, you see that not always, but very often, radical religious change can happen in a matter of years. So who knows? like there's that, you know, I'm in, I'm in this like trick question where I, I'm not exactly sure what I'm saying if I say yes or no. Um, I think that all scripture says much more than it's, um, than it's, than it's um, revelator understands. I think we see that with Joseph, right? He didn't understand the meaning of every revelation that he produced. Um, and that doesn't um, detract from the divinity of the revelation process. In fact, it may add to its mystery. So I don't know whether the current church authorities fully understand um, what the proclamation means and especially what it will mean going forward. Thanks. That's the time we have. See you all at dinner. Thank you.